Okay, I'll, I am uh, Major Billy C. Hall, U.S. Army, uh, retired. Uh, actually, I started out in the Marine Corps back in 1941 as a $21 a month private. And uh, so I did a tour of duty, well, two tours of duty in the Marine Corps and uh, got out right after the war was over. I was in aviation all during the time that I was uh, in the Marine Corps. Back, I flew in the back seat of uh, the old uh, SBD dive bomber and later on the torpedo bomber. And uh, so uh, I got out right after the war was over and uh, eventually joined the California National Guard and uh, uh, as a communications sergeant and they needed communications people so bad and didn't have a communications officer in the regiment that I was in. Uh, so I wound up doing both duties. Uh, I was a communications sergeant and also the communications officer. And so I did a tour duty uh, uh, in Korea that way. And uh, they, uh, uh, they were having a problem with the fact that all of the aviation people in the old Army, uh, Army Air Corps, went to the Air Force. And uh, the Army didn't have aviation people anymore. And they were wanting aviation in the Army. And so uh, they offered the opportunity for any of us that were uh, had uh, gotten the I'd gotten the commission by this time, and any of us any of us that had uh, served for a year in our branch, and I had served for uh, over a year in in the uh, uh, infantry branch, could put in for flight school, and so I did, and I put in for flight school, and eventually got to go to uh, fixed wing flight school. And the Army didn't have any flight schools at that time. The Air Force did. So I had to go from the Army to the Air Force uh, to go to flight, uh, the primary flight school and then back to uh, the Army to, uh, to get uh, uh, tactical training. So I became an Army pilot, an Army, what they call Army aviators. And uh, I did, uh, did that, uh, went to Korea. Well, no, let's see, I went to... Uh, where did I go? Went to, well, all around in the States, uh, in Alaska, uh, as fixed wing, and then eventually uh, added helicopter training to it and uh, became a helicopter pilot as well and was sent to uh, Vietnam, took a, a co they were making companies of helicopter pilots now, and helicopters in the Army. And so we, uh, we established three new helicopter companies and uh, I was, went with the uh, went with them to uh, Korea, not Korea to Vietnam, and uh, uh, flew helicopter pilot hel flew helicopter in Vietnam at that point, and then retired. I was in between the uh, freshman year in high school and sophomore year in high school, and this recruiting sergeant came through my hometown, a little small hometown near Amarillo, Texas, and uh, cow, cow country, and talked to a bunch of us kids to belong to the Marines. And he looked like, he looked great. He looked really sharp in that. And I wanted to be in communications and in radio at the time, so he had me lined up that I could be, go to radio school and, uh, and really learn something. And, uh, People ask me, says, did you, did you lie to get in the service? Because I was only 15 and a half years old. And uh, I said, no, I didn't lie about it, but that recruiting sergeant sure did. So he had me all lined up to go, and my folks, my dad had just gotten remarried, and uh, I was kind of a fifth wheel in the family. And uh, he says, okay, he says, if he wants to do that, he can do it. So uh, I went into uh, the Marine Corps uh, and was going to go into radio and wound up not being able to go into radio, but got into aviation and had a ball. Well, there was five of us that he had planned on going to San Diego to recruit training. When they come to pick us up, there was only one standing there, and that, that was me. I, I grew up in the Marine Corps, let's put it that way. Uh, I... Uh, I wanted to be a Marine, and I wasn't going to let anything happen that kept me from being a Marine. And uh, 
I, I did whatever was necessary. I've got memory after memory after memory, but uh, uh, what, what, might, uh, what might be interesting? Well, one of the first things that is memorable, uh, we, you know, you, you, you always, uh, each Marine, each platoon that went through training would set up the first three people that acted like they knew what they were doing or started picking up the training to become te uh, temporary squad leaders. And uh, so after we'd been in for about a month, uh, they had already picked three people to be squad leaders. And we were standing out in front of the, uh, the barracks one day, and here come two, two NCIS, Navy criminal investigating type guys in civilian clothes and uh, handcuffs and walks up to one of our squad leaders, put handcuffs on him and takes him away. We found out later, this guy had been in the army, went AWOL, absent without leave, and joined the Marine Corps and was in our platoon and uh, they came and found him and took him away. So that's kind of like, kind of like being in the army, going to a no, rob working in a bank, robbing a bank on that side of the street, and hiding out in a service station across the street. But I got a chance to go to uh, go to aviation when uh, when our platoons were sent out to wherever they were going to go to, and. Uh, uh, I went to North Island where the Navy uh, was and they had a few of us, a handful of us that were going to be in Army aviation. And that was before we had any airplanes and uh, our, the only pilots that were designated to be Marine pilots were flying with the Navy. But uh, eventually I was sent to uh, radio school the one that I would have gone to if it had been, if I'd have been uh, with the Marine Corps, you know, going in with the regular Marines, uh, they uh, they sent me to North Island to uh, Jacksonville, Florida, and I'm supposed to teach aviation radio in Jacksonville, Florida. I I'm just out of school myself, but they I wound up teaching a group of Royal Canadian pilots, Royal Canadian pilots that, uh, that were down in Jacksonville learning how to fly, teaching them Morse code so that they could work the radios. And along, I, I wanted out of there. And uh, they came in with, uh, with a word, uh, if you wanted to, to they, wanted, they were looking for volunteers to join the Marine Expeditionary Force. I guess that's what they called it. Anyway, didn't know it at that time, but that was the formation of the group of people that were going to land on Guadalcanal. And uh, so they sent me back to uh, Jack, to uh, uh, Naval, well, I forget what the heck they call it here. Uh, it was still here, not on Pendleton, but uh, right nearby Pendleton. And that's where they started getting all the troops and lined up and they started getting aviation to go into the landing on Guadalcanal. Well, I, I was put into uh, an outfit called MAG-11, which was Marine Air Group uh, 11, and uh, we had uh, a, a, torpedo, a dive bomber squadron that was uh, VMSB-141, and uh, we had a torpedo bombing squadron no, they didn't, that didn't even exist at that time. But we also had a fighter pilot uh, squadron, BMF-121. And so we were doing, uh, I was flying in the back seat of, uh, of SBDs at that time. And uh, we, were, we made the landing on Guadalcanal and uh, started flying from a place called Henderson Field, or Cactus was the the tactical word for it. And uh, it wasn't like the landings that they had later on where you had enough troops to go in and make a, you capture an island. Uh, capturing Guadalcanal was, was a long time, several months 
because we didn't have enough troops or ships or airplanes or whatever to do that. So it was done in piecemeal. And uh, when I made the landing on the canal, my landing portion, we came in on board uh, troop transports that had uh, a rope uh, a thing hanging down on the side of the plane, uh, side of the ship. So you'd come down this rope ladder type thing and uh, get into a Higgins boat. And the Higgins boat is a flat bottom boat that can run up pretty much onto the ground and has a great big, uh, great big front end to it. And that front end drops down and then we can run out and we were all set with rifles and bayonets on there to shoot and there wasn't anybody there. So we made a landing on a non, on a non-defended area and uh, as soon as the Japanese discovered that we had gone where they didn't expect us to go, they started bombing the heck out of us. And uh, uh, that was my entry into, in, in, entry into combat. When I volunteered for uh, this uh, expeditionary force, uh, they sent me back to California, and uh, I came to a place called Kearney Mesa, and uh, they had uh, scraped out a runway out on the open area that, where our planes were flying from, and they were amassing people from all kinds of places coming in and that was the formation of uh, MAG-11 and, uh, and the, two, uh, the two sister squadrons. And uh, since I knew code, Morse code, I wound up working in the, uh, pulled into the uh, MAG-11 headquarters to uh, help uh, receive uh, the code messages uh, that were being sent to uh, the Marine Corps uh, aviation people there and all the ships at sea and every place else. And so uh, I didn't get it. I kind of halfway was getting some training in the back seat of the dive bombers, but I was also doing code duty uh, in the tent for uh, pick, receiving the code. And uh, when we when we made the landing on Guadalcanal, uh, I went immediately to uh, the fighter squadron, uh, and this is one that uh, Joe Foss. Uh, uh, probably everybody remembers Joe Foss because he was one of the first uh, Congressional Medal of Honor winners, uh, recipients uh, in that, uh, that we had. And I was working both of them. Eventually I got back to my, uh, dive, my dive bomber squadron and uh, the Navy had just gotten wiped out with torpedo bombers as far as taking them in on uh, ships and they stopped making torpedo runs on ships with the torpedo bombers, and they gave them all gave them all to the Marine Corps, and we started dive bombing with uh, with those uh, torpedo bombers, and stopped using the old uh, dive bomber because the dive bomber could only carry one bomb, and you came in and you dropped that one bomb, you had to go back and get another one, so at least the uh, torpedo bombers had uh, had more uh, space. Well. My, they used to have, there used to be a deal of don't volunteer for anything. And I say volunteer for everything. And while you're volunteering for it, learn as much as you can about what you're doing there because you're picking up more information. And uh, I say learn all you can about the guy that's uh, over you, the one that's underneath you, the people on the right and on the left because you never know when those guys are gonna get hit and not be available. So I did my level best to learn everything I could so that as opportunities existed, you could take, take advantage of that. And I hadn't gone to college. I was enlisted and hadn't finished high school. And so I had to go up rank from the back door rather than coming in from the front of being qualified through a college degree. So uh, I learned, uh, learned everything I could to be able to take care of the situation. How has it changed? Well, I can't tell you about the ground forces, but aviation-wise grew and grew and grew. 
uh, as you know, aviation was really building. And so uh, instead of us, us having uh, us losing all of the aviation people that we had to the Air Force, when the Air Force was formed, they took all of those people. My, uh, the Marine, the uh, Army decided we needed aviation as well. So uh, they started trying to build up aviation with what was left. And uh, I had gotten my, com I had gotten a commission uh, by going to OCS from, while I was in the infantry. And uh, I'd gotten a commission. And uh, if you had served, or well, I'd gone to Korea. And uh, if you had served for a year, at least a year in your basic branch, infantry, artillery, signal, whatever, you could apply for flight school. And so I, I had qualified for that. Uh, in infantry, and so I went into uh, a, 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 I put in for flight school and got approval on that, and uh, was eventually sent to flight school. I think the Marine Corps is uh, is just <laughs> it's it's the epitome of uh, of having the ability to uh, take the high ground, hold it, do whatever is necessary, move in where where it's needed. Uh, do go wherever you're needed. I think the Marine Corps is is the place to be. Probably the little small helicopter, the, the little two-man uh, Bell helicopter, if you will, because there uh, you're in more control of that that chopper. You can make it do all kinds of things. Uh, it was fun to fly. You could go do things with it. And uh, and it was the first ones I learned how to fly too. But uh, but I, I enjoyed I enjoyed being in a, a fixed wing pilot, and I enjoyed being a helicopter pilot. Uh, I was uh, I was uh, enlisted in the in the, the Marine Corps to start with in World War II, of being air crew. So I was an air crew, and then a fixed wing pilot, and then a helicopter pilot. So I got in on all of the aviation, and they were just bringing the Cobra into country because I'd taken a, a, a company of helicopters to Vietnam. The old D-model, D, D this, well, not this one. This is a much later model, but uh, the old D-model uh, helicopter, and uh, we were take, beginning to start taking people into landing zones and dropping them off to fight. And uh, so, uh, I was doing that and finished up there. They were just bringing the Cobra, which was the gunship, the first gunship of the uh, of marine aviation. That was the first ones that we had, and I was involved in that. And that was the first ones that we took companies of heli of helicopters and pilots together. Well, I, I already I can see all kinds of improvements. It's bigger. It's got a larger engine. I think it's got two engines. Uh, it's uh, it's got things on it that we didn't have. First of all, uh, some of some of the some of the uh, slicks they call slicks if they're not gunships, and uh, some of the slicks even have uh, uh, machine guns on them now or rockets. So uh, it would be neat that uh, they had those to uh, for the pilot to be able to fire. Otherwise, you got a turret gunner. I mean, not a turret gunner. I had those on the fixed wings, but you had a uh, a door gunner and a and a, the main, the crew chief on the helicopter was also on one of the doors, and so they fired 50 caliber machine guns from uh, from the side, and we didn't we didn't fire uh, the pilots that weren't firing weapons uh, on the guns on the ships that we took in at that time. Okay. Well, one of the things is. One of the things that uh, people started doing once you were in combat and coming back, uh, they would thank you for your service. And so I used to think, well, you know, thank you for caring and uh, appreciate that and all of that. So finally I came up with the idea of telling them that they were worth it. And uh, so we picked that up as, a, as an answer to people uh, thanking us for being in the service. And uh, you, uh, uh, you learn more and more about uh, what was going on. When people 
come to me and say thank you for your service, I sit, look at them and say, you were worth it. And I also uh, say, not only you're thanking me for my service, I want to thank you and your family for providing me with a country that was worth fighting for. And uh, I enjoyed my tour of duty in the Marine Corps. Hoorah!